Thank you all so much for the opportunity to, I guess, follow up at this point on the faculty meeting um, that I uh, joined a few weeks ago. Um, so we'll get a little bit more into the weeds with generative AI today um, than we had the opportunity to, to do last time. I think that's probably where you guys are at at this point, where you kind of want to um, kind of think about some specific instructional strategies and start thinking about the assignments in your courses. There's considerations for generative AI use that are really specific to the types of assignments that, that you specifically have. And so it's more useful for me to hear from you and us to kind of, um, you know, uh, riff on that a little bit rather than me giving you some fully formed recipes. So that's sort of the nature of the, the uh, title of this presentation is really kind of, I, I love to cook. Um, and uh, one of the things as you're learning to cook is you um, you kind of start by like looking up recipes on the internet and you just sort of like execute those recipes as is. As you get better at doing that really, really frequently, eventually you start to understand how different ingredients work together um, and sort of what their function is and all the chemistry and everything like that. And you can start to come up with your own recipes. So what I wanna do is rather than give you recipes um, today, um, start to kind of break down what the capabilities of AI are um, generative AI are, generally speaking, and also some of the kind of foundational principles of learning um, that hopefully you can kind of put those things together and start to think about different applications um, given your specific context. So we'll do a quick review of artificial intelligence technology concepts. Understanding the technology also helps you understand what the limitations of the technology are, and at least as it stands right now, so that's useful to know that. Uh, again, I'll review the general AI capabilities. We'll talk about kind of foundational learning concepts and put those in the context of AI. I know I talked to Stevie earlier and, and she pointed out that many of you are continue to be concerned about academic integrity. So I actually moved that slide sort of up towards the beginning so we can kind of clear the air in terms of academic integrity right from the start. And then we can kind of progress on to talking about some instructional strategies. Um, I also have been doing some presentations recently with students undergraduate students, as well as world campus um, adult students. Um, and so I'm gonna, I can share with you some of how I'm talking about this stuff with them so that maybe you can mirror some of those strategies yourself. And then I really wanna spend a, a, at least half of the time that we have here talking about applications of AI in your classes. Um, so I'd really love to hear from you. So a couple of questions here, just to get a, um, just to get a, get a sense of where you guys are all at. Um, and, and maybe you can just kind of jump in and answer these in any particular order that you want. Uh, so the first question is, do you feel that generative AI has the potential? By the way, gen AI is, I guess, what there's, people are using in terms of a, uh, you want to close this? Um, that, that's just that's the shorthand that, that has emerged. So I'll use that a lot in the presentation. So do you feel that generative AI has the potential to positively impact learning or your teaching? Um, have you implemented new academic integrity strategies from the standpoint of, of like dealing with inappropriate use. Um, I'd love to talk about how you're thinking about academic integrity within your own context. Um, and then maybe for more, from a more constructive use of generative AI, have you, can, have you started to consider adapting any assignments to incorporate AI? Maybe not necessarily you're actively doing it this semester, but you're starting to look at your assignments and starting to think about them. This is the perspective that I have. Yeah. One of the things that students never do is they never provide them. They write it and they think Great. it's done. And I feel like having them generate something with AI and then deconstructing it yeah. would help them to understand how they're writing things like that. Yeah, from a learning standpoint, what's more useful? Constructing something, a fully po polished piece of writing or going through the process of improving over time? Yeah, that's really central to, to generative AI and what it can accomplish from a teaching and learning standpoint. If you're not at the point where you're thinking about this or have any specific thoughts about um, instructional strategies, um, what is your general feeling like just from an impact on even society, maybe not even education, but generally in society? Do you have a strong feeling at this point about the impact of the, the potential impact of generative AI? Like, is this, do you think this is a flash in the pan or do you think that this is a disruptive effect? Mm -hmm. Not in a way. Yeah, not just in education, but probably in all aspects of society. I'm going to be, uh, get off my lawn boy yeah. position for a second. <laughs> and, and there's a piece of me that does worry that, um, 
A, about inequities that could be built into generative AI unknowingly by the builders. And students already have a difficult time critically thinking and evaluating information. And I'm not sure how this makes that better. Yeah, it's kind of handing off a critical skill to some right. some dumb machine or even intelligent machine. Yeah. Yeah, and the types of information you put in these systems can be sensitive, and that's why I think ge the general counsel has been taking so long to come to a decision on this because the way that people engage with these systems might be divulging data about you that they're incorporating into the models and scary things like that. Um, can you repeat what people in the audience say? Can you speak up a little bit so that everybody can hear? I, I think that concern uh, that was just, um, you know, having to log into these systems and how the systems collect data about you and, and the typical sort of privacy concerns, maybe that are exacerbated by the nature of the way that you interact with these systems. Um, to, to respond also to something, the CV has talked about inequities and I'll mention this in, in a minute, but certain systems cost money. So Microsoft Copilot, and I'll mention this in a minute, but Microsoft Copilot just released their AI, AI tools. Microsoft introduced Copilot, which is a pay tool that costs $30 a month. The pay version of GPT, ChatGPT costs $20 a month. And the paid version is vastly better than the free version. So if you're requiring this for students, then some students have basically an advantage in the class if they can shell out $20 a month which may not seem like a lot, but I don't know. When I was a student, I could barely afford to pay for food for myself. So um, so that's that's a consideration. The other thing about inequity and issues there is the bias that's baked into how their models are trained and how that comes through in the responses. Uh, right. So Stevie had mentioned that if there was a faculty member that was potentially required in the paid version as a material for the class. Um, and and that, I guess, is permissible. I don't know. I haven't heard that. And I always wondered about that. So one of the speakers at FLC Accelerate last two weeks ago, um, they had a virtual conference. And one of the speakers is George Peans, who is currently doing a lot with mm -hmm. AI. And he raised a really interesting point of um, one of the things that he anticipates happening is that uh, AI will allow us to sort of um, redistribute some of our the sort of base level skills and allow us to sort of focus on the higher yeah. order thinking skills, um, which is wonderful if that if that doesn't be if that is the shift that occurs. Um, but one of the other things that he mentioned was the fact that. Um, there is a concern around AI and the fact that there's only a, approximately 50 to 60,000 people in the entire world who actually have a skill in order to help program mm -hmm. AI and to help train it. So there are, you know, it, it, there really is a high degree of potential for biases to be integrated into these systems. Yeah, and once they're trained, once they're trained, they're a black, they're a black box. Right, like that, that. There's a reason that. There's a reason that um, that the G, that the data that GPT three or GPT four is based upon is 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 not more recent than 2021, because GPT at least 3.5 cost about almost two million dollars to train and probably several months of compute time to train. So you can't like if there are biases or problems with the data, it's it's practically impossible to like turn that on a dime and fix that issue. And, and if it does, these models do give back a harmful response. Um, it's hard to even figure out what in the model is causing that response because it's 100, GPT 3.5 is 175 billion parameters, like little neurons of information. So where in that model is the awful racist thing that G chat GPT just said to you, like, and, and how do I debug that? It's not like a program. You don't debug it the same way. Before you really want to just take, um, I think it would be easier to put something if you just wonder about uh, what's the sure. to do that because the folks are going to Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, I'll, um, and the other thing Megan had mentioned was um, 
Uh, by the way, George Siemens who is, is a pioneer in, uh, in learning analytics. So this is sort of a natural progression for him. I will say that it is interesting to sort of get at a college level, we want students to be operating at a higher higher level of reasoning skills. And, and But you need to build towards that. So hopefully we're not giving away the opportunity to establish those sort of foundational skills in the process of leapfrogging over those things and relying too much on AI. So again, this is one of these societal problems that we need to um, we need to work out. And I don't, we've never had like easily accessible thinking machines that we can talk to in a really natural way. So this is, remains to be seen whether what George says is right. Um, but he's a smart guy, so I trust him. Okay, so let's talk about academic integrity for a second. Um, and again, I don't wanna, I don't have a lot to say in this regard because I don't think that there are particularly good uh, good strategies here, but I will, Talk about what I've gleaned so far, and I, I encourage you all to uh, to jump in with your thoughts about this. The one of the ones that's sort of obvious is really good communication with students. So making your expectations about the use of generative AI really clear in your syllabus, um, not just in the syllabus, because we all know that sometimes students don't read the syllabus, but actually if you do have assignments that seem to be particularly um, uh, susceptible to the use of generative AI, like a writing assignment, um, that you also incorporate those um, expectations right in the instructions for the assignment. So it's kind of in front of them at all times. Um, this is one thing that I can't stress enough. The detectors that became available in the early days of ChatGPT all the way back a year ago, they do not work. And even if they do work or purport to work, what they're providing you is a confidence score. So this is a confusing thing. And this is why we told Turnitin that we didn't want to want to turn on their AI detector at Penn State. Um, one of the reasons is that it provides it provides a confidence score. Normally, when you use Turnitin, what you're getting is like a 50% of this paper has been plagiarized. When you get 50% from those detectors, what that 50% means is it's 50% confident that that was generated by AI. That is not something that I want to bring a student up on academic integrity violation case about, like I'm 50% confident that you used AI. Um, and even just from an intuitive standpoint, sometimes generative AI um, responses are kind of generic. And so you can kind of spot them because it like repeats things or it, it kind of like doesn't add it very much like personal um, personal details into, into the AI, uh, into the responses. So it's really kind of hard to spot just, um, just intuitively. Um, and so I can, and I've heard cases where faculty are, are, um, are uh, confronting students with suspected use, improper use of generative AI or passing it off as their own writing and getting into the sort of circular conversation where the student says, I didn't use generative AI. And they're like, well, this sure looks like generative AI. So where do you go from there? Um, so one of the things, and Stevie and I were talking about this earlier today, is having a conversation with your students and verifying the student's understanding of that of that material. So if they did indeed write a paper about this topic, they should be able to answer basic questions about it. So again, it's sort of, uh, you know, the degree, how much do you want to trust your students um, and what kind of relationship you have with them. But I think some one-on-one -on -one conversations with them about their use, and maybe they'll fess up and say, I did use AI for some parts of this. And then you say, that's fine this time, I'll give it a pass, but next time please cite or explain where you used AI. Those can be constructive conversations. And at this stage of society where we're still building these norms, those conversations could make an impression on that student and they'll do better next time. Um, we did develop AI literacy modules. They're at AI AI, that's academic integrity and artificial intelligence, .psu.edu. That's linked right from the front of that site. Um, that's a good thing to include at the beginning, like the orientation part of your course. And uh, and you can make that, you can put like knowledge checks in there, like real basic knowledge checks. You can make it required for students. And they'll that way that includes things like ethics, um, pro, you know, effective use, um, evaluating the output of AI so they get kind of get better at this stuff. I um, mean, you can pick and choose, you can modify those as you see fit, however you want to use them, but they are resources that are built for you that you can start using. The last part is really what I want to spend the bulk of our time today on, which is realizing that it's very hard to stop students from using generative AI and start to think about uh, meaningfully integrating it into your into your courses. So I think that that's at this stage of the game and probably going forward, um, the, the more productive strategy. And, you know, we're at the like the invention of the calculator period of time, right? It's like 
for math teachers didn't want did not want students to use calculators and they thought that it would atrophy their brains and they'd never be able to use to do math but now they're just able to do more advanced math and we use calculators in classrooms all the time um so that's really the that's really the period that we need to get into here Okay, uh, I'll go quick on this one, but these are just a few of the tools some you may or may not be aware of. I think everybody knows about ChatGPT. The point that I wanted to make there was just that there is a free version and a plus version. The plus version is $20 a month, and that gives you a much better model. So there is a huge difference in the performance of these two things and a bunch of plugins that do advanced data analysis and um, they can take files and, and have, allow you to have a conversation with the files and all kinds of cool things. So there's a big difference between the free and the paid version. Claude 2, uh, that was developed by folks that splintered off of OpenAI who developed ChatGPT, a really great model as well. And an interesting thing about um, that company is that they, uh, they have adopted this thing called constitutional AI, AI, which is basically incorporating human values into the model so that there's this kind of a, as a safety me mechanism, so a way to make sure that the generative AI is providing you responses that are aligned with things like harmful bias and you know, other safety related things, so that's good. Perplexity is a newer one to me. This one is really being built as, a, as um, a generative AI for students. So there's a lot of capabilities within that system for like reading research papers and doing data analysis. And, and, and so a lot of the faculty that I talk to that are using AI are not using ChatGPT, they're using Perplexity. Um, so that's a good one to check out. Our, uh, GitHub Copilot is for coding. Microsoft Copilot, confusingly, is... Um, so that's baked right into Office 365 and it will scan a folder of documents and create memos and pr presentations for you based upon your data. Um, some of the demos are pretty cool about that. There's an image generation things like Midjourney and Dolly. My team within World Campus Learning Design is using Adobe Firefly to develop course graphics. Um, that's a really cool uh, time saver and productivity enhancer for people that work in the creative fields. Um, Elicit.com is kind of also similar to Perplexity, is a specifically a tool for researchers. So if you are in the, if you have Courses that have require students to do like literature reviews, or you're in a graduate student or have graduate students, it's really awesome because you can not only um, you can sort of state what your what your research questions are in a really human sort of form, um, and or what theory theoretical foundations you're interested in, and it will understand what you're trying to ask and find all the papers, and then actually allow you to sort of incorporate those papers into the conversation, so you can actually like talk to the paper, like ask the paper questions and it will read through the paper and kind of synthesize parts of that for you. So that's a really cool service. Um, I think in the interest of time, I can skip by this. The only point I will say just about the techno technological foundations of generative AI is that we trained large la these large language models. We expected them to be able to sort of talk to us like people that was the expected behavior of the way that these things worked. However, they do more advanced things like reason, solve problems, um, analyze data. And it's literally just a model that's trained on a bunch of language. So we don't fully understand some of those emergent behaviors right now. Um, and, and that's both exciting and scary in terms of sort of how we shape this future, our, our future working alongside of AI. Okay, a couple of other things. And I mentioned this when I went through the tools real quick. But this is where I want you to start to think about as you approach the assignments in your courses, as you're going through revisions in your courses, um, to not just be looking at recipes, like pre-baked recipes that people are developing around generative AI, but start to think about what the nature of your content is, what the nature of, of the way that you like to teach is, um, and then think about some of these capabilities and start to marry them together and say, I think that this part of my course and the way I expect students to learn um, seems to jive with you know some of these particular capabilities that we know or that these models are really good with. Um, I already mentioned for, with illicit.com and perplexity summarizing long documents, and these can be longer and longer. They used to be like one or two pages that they could consume. Now they the GPT-4 can consume entire books, right? So you could actually upload um, an entire novel and then start asking questions of the model 
um, that get into the meaning of that book and the overall themes and whatever. So research papers, for example, are easily within the context window of things that AI can understand. Uh, some people don't understand that AI can, uh, that generative AI can analyze data. So I've done this within my own research is upload a data set and just say, conduct a re regression analysis on this data and tell me anything interesting that you find. And just with that as a prompt, it gives me all the right metrics, does the analysis, and it says there seems to be a um, correlation between this independent var variable and your dependent variable. Um, kind of stunning how quickly it, it does that. So if you do have that type of an assignment in your courses, AI can definitely do that. And students will be catching on to that fact. It's really good at writing code. Um, so if you do have more technical classes, very few professional coders today are not using AI to code. Um, so that's something to think about. Uh, I think expand on short prompts is fairly straightforward. You can ask it a question and it'll answer it for you. Some people don't understand that that you can actually upload, you know, maybe some initial ideas and, and then say, with this as a starting point, um, rewrite this in a particular format, like write this as an, a memo or a memorandum, memorandum of understanding, or put this information inside of a table, and it can sort of restructure the whole document for you. So that's really handy. Um, again, it can solve logic problems. One example of this that I think Microsoft talked about is that you can go in there and say, here's a, here's a list of objects in the real world. Stack these things in the optimal way so that, this, that they don't fall over. Right, so why would a language model understand how to do that? But a lot of times it gets most of that right. Um, so you can imagine as, that it's actually doing something more than just spitting knowledge back at you. It's actually applying some sort of logic or reasoning to that process. So you could uh, theoretically, theoretically, you could give it the square footage of your trunk and it could add your vacation for you. Totally. Yeah. Now, the problem is, is that it might get that wrong, but occasionally it does. But, uh, but yeah. <laughs> Uh, the other one is role playing or rewriting to a specific audience. And I'll sp expand on this one in a moment. Like, there's fun ways to use this, like, you know, take my essay and rewrite it in Shakespearean English or something like that. But you can also say, I am a budding scientist. I don't know how to communicate like scientists communicate. Can you take this paper that I wrote and rewrite it for me in more formal scientific language? And it will help you do that. But that's really cool because you're expected to communicate effectively in that context as you go out into the, into the you know, professional world. Um, and so those norms are important for you to learn and that's one way to learn them, yeah. So one other thing that, uh, another example that you want to release alongside of that in the future is that I've heard about neurodivergent students yes. who take long paragraphs of information and mm -hmm. plug it into ChatGPT and then tell it to summarize it into like five to 10 bullet points and it does that, it's really helpful for them to summarize the information in a really clear way. It's usually very accurate. Yeah, yeah, good. So so for so for those who couldn't hear that, for neurodivergent students to be able to just restructure the information in a way that better suits how they, you know, uh, uh, process information. I, the other thing I, where I thought you were going with that is also from the communication standpoint, if you have a hard time communicating yourself clearly, maybe because of neurodivergence or more, or if you are English as a second language, right? That's always a problem. So you can just say, I'm gonna do my best to put these ideas together, but I know it's broken English, rewrite this more clearly for me. Um, and that's beneficial, obviously, that's a good thing to be able to do that. Um, so those are, just keep those in mind. Those are some basic capabilities of AI. Um, this is, Kind of the way that I'm starting to think about this now, just to start to serve as a framework for how we can think about um, updating our instruction, is to, to start thinking about sort of foundational learning concepts. So, like, re regardless of um, regardless of AI and specific applications, this is like a hundred years of learning sciences, um, things that we know about how people learn and how the brain works and how we process information. Um, I just wanted to list a couple of these things off and then to some degree put them in the context of AI so you can see how these particular concepts related to learning um, might be relevant here. This is not an exhaustive list. I think that the great the good folks at Dutton can help you to expand on this and really start to break your break your the, your intended learning goals 
out so that you can you can start to think of as AI applications. But this is a starting point. The point is it's a, it's a rough framework um, for you to sort of structure your thinking. Um, so I'll start with, so a couple of things I'll cover here is self-regulated learning. So how students monitor their own learning and reflect and, and uh, build self-efficacy about their own capabilities, social learning, like how we collaborate and learn together, um, how we go th through the process of problem solving and, and the process of learning, how we take uh, kind of initial maybe ideas that we don't fully know how to express in full level of detail that's expected of us. We, uh, you know, elaboration helps us to expand on ideas and introduce new concepts and connect them to prior concepts. And, um, and that's really an essential part of learning and also communicating effectively. Um, and then knowledge building, just how we operate in a knowledge knowledge uh, knowledge oriented society and workforce. Okay, so elaboration, as I just said, adding new information to more fully understand a concept, connect connect the new information that you introduce with prior knowledge that helps you to retain information um, and helps you to recall information when you connect it that way. So the the exercise of taking a simple idea and elaborating and adding, adding new concepts is really a, a basic and foundational part of learning, right? So, so how does this connect to AI? From a, a student can provide the starting point, right? So they might start off with a naive idea about a particular concept in your course, but they need to articulate at the very, at, at the very minimum at the starting of the course, that naive idea, and then push the AI to ask for additional details. Um, and they can start to get into what's called prompt engineering, so ways of asking the AI um, targeted questions to expand those ideas in particular directions that are aligned with sort of where they're thinking is that kind of do that in iter iterative fashion, expand out on ideas that are thin and really start to come up with a more robust uh, a bus robust response maybe to an assignment. Um, so so basic ways that you can talk to talk to ChatGPT, for example, is here's my initial idea. And that might just be a bunch of bullet points or an outline, right? And then say, what are some of the related ideas that I should consider? And then it'll start getting you going. Then you can revise that and say, okay, here's my draft incorporating those ideas. I still think it's thin in this area. Let's expand on this a little bit more. And through that iterative process, you can get more and more sophisticated with, with, uh, with your writing. Um, so instead of, again, to Stevie's point of like not asking students to turn in this sort of polished writing, but actually going through this thinking process um, over time, you can kind of reconstruct the writing assignment in your course to include those iterations. And then a lot of times, and this will be common to a lot of these different strategies, is to turn in each of those iterations and kind of explain like, this was my initial idea. This is how I worked with AI to expand on this. This is what it provided. This is what I synthesized and threw away. And, and kind of instead of turning in that final product, you're actually turning in the conversation. Um, and, and that really demonstrates your thinking and your mastery a lot more than just a final product. Uh, Self-regulated -regula learning, right? This is another thing. If you have done any work in the learning sciences, you know that um, things like monitoring and reflection, metacognitive, developing metacognitive skills are really essential for students. Um, in order to in order to learn, you need to understand where your misconceptions are um, and overcome those mis misconceptions. And part of being able to do that is monitoring your thinking through reflection, externalizing your thinking so that it's almost like in, a, in an object in front, of you, in front of you that you can look at and say, this is where my thinking is at right now. Clearly, I don't understand this part of it. And again, through iteration um, with the AI, start to um, overcome those bits of misconception. And because this is just you and a AI, um, as opposed to sort of a group setting or a group work setting where students might be embarrassed about their lack of understanding, you can sort of be super honest about what parts of that you don't understand and, and chip away at those things um, over time through, through a back and forth conversation. So really developing metacognitive skills and really just unflinchingly facing your misunderstandings and overcoming them is I do that all the time. I'm working on my PhD right now and there's very complex concepts that I need to work through. And it's really nice to be able to talk those things through with AI and it does a really great job in those types of conversations. So I think you can, again, sort of get a sense of an instructional strategy where you're um, asking students to go through that iterative process of idea development and reflection and refining. 
This is just a real quick note on self-efficacy. Self-efficacy is sort of a, a student's own confidence about their ability to accomplish uh, certain learning tasks. Um, again, this is a precursor to learning. So if you don't have a lot of self-confidence, you can't really learn effectively. You're always going to be sort of timid about approaching a subject. Um, again, AI is, a, is a, a safe place for you to confront those feelings of inadequacy that all students inevitably have and, and kind of boost their confidence. Um, and uh, you can start to feel as you work through those difficult ideas um, that those things that you can kind of viscerally feel like you're stuck on a particular idea, as you overcome them, you build confidence. And then when you have to do a presentation or write a paper that you actually turn in, you've worked through those problems and built that self-efficacy. So this is a really wonderful thing that really there wasn't a way for students to do that easily before. Uh, social learning, this is something that I'm studying quite a bit, how students collaborate with each other. I think there's all the way going back to Lev Vygotsky and the, I don't know, Stevie, do you remember, or Megan Vygotsky is like the 30s or 20s or something like that, like a long time ago that we've been studying this stuff, 100 years. Um, yeah, all learning is social. It doesn't happen in, ha it doesn't happen in a vacuum. The interesting thing about natural language processing and large language models is they talk to you like a person. So you can start to think of them like a learning partner instead of being just like a tool, like a smart search engine, you can actually engage them as like a social learning partner. So the same sort of things that you do in a group project, you could do with AI sitting alongside of you um, and, and engaging in sort of really natural discourse with the AI. Um, you can get AI, this is kind of cool to adopt a particular persona. So again, if you're in sciences and you wanna to start to learn how to talk to scientists effectively, because that's what you're gonna do for a living, you can ask AI, um, I wanna have a conversation with you about this topic. As you talk to me, talk to me in a way that you would expect a scientist to talk to me. Um, and then you can start to adopt some of those patterns of speech that are you know, norms for, for a discipline that you need to adopt. Um, and so there's AI literacy and other things that you can build into your courses um, to provide some scaffolding for students to, you know, to engage with the AI in this way. Um, I think we talked a little bit about analysis already. Um, I think, the interesting thing here is, is if you have something like data analysis or other sort of technical work that you expect students to do, um, there are particular discipline specific ways of approaching that analysis. And you can have students through, through sort of trial and error, build out the statistical skills, build out those analytical skills, skills through conversation with AI. Um, it can, you can, after the analysis, when you write up what your findings are, you can put that into ChatGPT and ask it to analyze to see if there's any sort of logical errors or inconsistency, internally inconsistent issues with your writing. Um, if you don't know how to analyze the data in the first place, you could say, here's my data set, here's the qualities of the data set, here's what I wanna get out of the data. I, again, this is something that I do in my own research, and then it can suggest procedures like particular statistical techniques that you might used to analyze that data. And it's usually pretty awesome. In fact, I've gone in whole different directions with my research because of things that ChatGPT suggested as a way of studying data. Um, so that's pretty cool. Uh, and lastly, knowledge building. I mentioned this already. You can think of generative AI as like a conversational search engine. So where you have assignments where you have to do something like a literature review, instead of doing the literature review, maybe, and I hate to say this, if, if any library colleagues hear me, I don't know what they're thinking about this, but instead of going to like the uh, Google Scholar or the library's website to do your literature review, just go to elicit.com or perplexity.ai. Then you can not only engage with that sort of search in a really organic sort of way, but then as it returns results back, you can take those papers and then have conversations with the papers. And so you spend a lot of time as a graduate student or a researcher reading papers that are not relevant and that you find yourself an hour later, like, why the heck did I just write that, read that paper that was useless for me? Instead of doing that, you could take five minutes to ask tar targeted questions of the paper, realize that it doesn't align, or maybe that that particular position is not really what you needed, but something related is and kind of go off in, a, in another direction with it and do that 10 times faster than you were able to before. So in those places where knowledge building and research are parts of the requirements of the course, um, this is a much more productive way of doing, of doing that type of work. Um, we have 17 minutes left. 
I can talk about some of the things that I've talked to students about, but I think it's more just iterations of what I'm talking about here. So um, maybe we can pause. I have a, I have a question, I guess. Um, hopefully people want to hear me. I'm going to speak up very loudly. Um, I'm wondering when you want students to predict something, right? Could this be, could, could a generative AI tool be used to help them predict something? Like they can put in a prediction and then the generative AI can let them know if their prediction is, is accurate, inaccurate, tweaking it, just to get them better at, at learning those some patterns that you might want them to learn. Yeah, so extrapolating on yeah. something. Yeah, maybe. I mean, the mathematical answer to that is it can do regression analysis because I've done that. So that's one statistical way to do predictions if you have data. But I don't think that's really what you're asking. Maybe you're saying like uh, uh, with the right. situation. In this model of weather, hmm. what would your forecast, your predictor forecast be? Because the model would say, I predict Yes, yeah. How does it differ from what you expect? I, I would say so. I mean, presumably somewhere in the training data, somebody shared an analysis like that. And basically what it would be doing in that case is saying, statistically, most of the time when people are searching for this particular answer, this seems to be the result. So if you're seeing these conditions, then probably it's associated with this outcome. I think, I think it remains to be seen how creative generative AI is. But then I would also say, how creative are people? Like the things that you think are creativity are really, you're just building on the shoulders of giants, right? So. Well, another example I don't think of is like in material science. If you have students looking at a particular material and they know some of its properties and you want to predict what it might do under a particular thing, you can, yeah. I'm assuming you do that via the map, but also there are some materials that, that they should just know those properties to say, well, yeah. in this instance, it's good for that and it's not good for that. Yeah. Yeah, and I would say at the very least, maybe you probably, if you're building a bridge, you shouldn't ask ChatGPT to ask you how to build a bridge because right. it might collapse very quickly. Um, but at the very least, it gets you pointing in the right direction. So you might, it might say, I think that the best way to approach that problem is this, or I think that the answer is this, but here's a couple of things that you could research. And that's more productive than just throwing darts to the dartboard or just taking shots in the dark. It's like directing your thinking in a more productive way. So I think it's worth doing but i this is what i always tell students don't don't immediately like use your critical thinking skills don't trust everything these things are telling you because they're not the, the problem and you we've all heard of this idea of hallucinations is chat gpt and these other models will very confidently give you bull crap like and it will sound extremely convincing and it will provide all sorts of supporting detail but it's it's just throwing the language together yeah so I don't know if anybody can hear you, but I was playing around with chat to the one day and it gave me an answer that had to do with learning styles. Oh. And so I, I take back in, you know, learning styles are a myth. Mm -hmm. Now what is the response? Um, and then it came back right away. It's like, yes, there actually is no evidence for this. And then I kept asking it questions and it, not much longer later, it worked learning styles back into the conversation. So like, oh, interesting. Yeah. 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 So like even me sort of correcting it wasn't enough for it to recognize that learning styles are still not valid. Huh. So yeah, I mean it, it's it's really interesting to see information that is that if you don't know your information well enough, you can get yourself yeah. into some real challenges where I could take stands in on AI in, in education and you really need to be making students aware of this and teaching them how to use it appropriately in the classroom. Because otherwise they could end up yeah. citing incorrect information and then getting a bad grade. And then you know, yeah. it, it can become a, a, a pretty strong pitfall for them. Yeah, but that's not inconsistent with the way that we, like if you ever went to a library session or you sent students to the library to talk about how to like critically evaluate your sources, like don't believe everything that you find and, um, that that's just the same thing, but it is like tempting to believe it because it sounds so confident in what it's saying. Which can I ask what tool you used in that? Used the free version or the paid yeah. version? So yeah, well, it might be something that's overcome in the paid version because these models do have memories, right? So if you do instruct it to set, instruct it in some way in the beginning of the conversation, it should have a memory that persists through the whole chat session. So if you say that's not true. Stop saying that. 
it should stop saying it, but that might only be in four and not 3.5. So yeah, all models are not equal. Uh, I put together demographic questions and I haven't done that in a long time. And this should have about your identity yeah. and you know how all that stuff should be worded by minute through 3.5. Yeah. And it did an excellent job of wording the yeah. questions for me and I took it against some goofy stuff and it it seems to work fine. But it would remember that I'm working a survey yeah. from one question to the next. Yeah. Yeah that's that's useful. Now there might be like new trends in those that sort of language that have come out in the last two years, and then it's not going to know those. So that's tricky. By the way, one other thing in terms of shaping its responses, uh, I know the paid version, I'm not sure if the free version has this, but if you log in, you can give it what, what are called custom instructions, and they persist and are incorporated into every single response. So in my custom instructions, I said, I am a learning design professional. I'm also a student studying learning sciences. I do this type of work. So please provide responses that are consistent with that those facts about me. And then I also said, in every one of your responses, provide citations. And I just put that as the custom instructions. And then I don't have to say that all the time. And so every single thing that ChatGPT tells me, it provides a citation for it. And the citations are usually pretty good. So it's actually verifying what it's telling me. That's the I, I I'm not sure if that custom instructions is in the free version. You can try it, but it's definitely in the paid version. Um, so, and it gets to prompt engineering, right? Like what are the strategies that you can put in the way that you articulate your prompts such that you're getting consistent um, results back? Um, what, I think most of these are, we've kind of talked through some of this stuff. Again, these are some things that I've talked to students about is um, maybe this will start to jog some of your own thinking about strategies for the classroom. We talked a lot about writing. This is a writing assistant. So, and again, think about me talking about this stuff to students. So like, how can you use generative AI effectively as a student? Start with a good outline and then feed that in the chat GPT and get it to elaborate. Rephrase, I already mentioned some of these examples, rewrite it, make this, this is really helpful if for anybody basically, right? Make this more concise, add some variety to my voc vocabulary. Um, those are the instructions that it'll take. Create a memo, put this in tabular form. So restructuring. Um, basically, if you're ha if you have writer's block, this is a good way to kind of dislodge you from from your writer's block and get into some more like the the flow state, right, with your writing. This is really cool it's for Claude and GPT Plus and Perplexity. You can upload files, so you could upload your course materials, and you guys, all your course materials are open. So you could download all those things, upload those files into ChatGPT and just say, create quiz questions for me. I need to practice this material and it'll actually generate like flashcards or quizzes, quiz questions for you that you can respond to. Do you have any policy on that kind of thing considering it's, it's a state copyrighted material? I, I don't know about copyright. And I, I, mean, I know that, that's, that's, student data. Yeah, right. I mean, you don't, Again, I'm not sure if they feel like it's necessary to write new policy because a lot of the stuff is already in policy. Like don't give away, don't break copyright by giving away information that you don't have the rights to use that way. Um, and I'm not sure with the sensitive data. I don't think the sensitive data, are you familiar with, I think it's 80, is it 8095? Is a sensitive data document, yeah. which includes the, the data of classification levels. So level one is like, the least sensitive data. It's just stuff that's already publicly available. And then two is where where there's personally identifiable information. And then three is like HIPAA protected data. I'm not sure if that those data classification categories include copyrighted material, but I bet you that they do. So be be aware of that. But you know, it remains to be seen how they're using this data. Like if you uploaded a book that was copyrighted. Um, it's just going to incorporate that information into its model, but it's not really going to store that whole book as is. So I think there's about 25 different cases being argued in federal courts around this country regarding copyright and fair use. I think that there's not legal precedent right now for a lot of those thorny questions. Um, but in any case, if you do have the rights for it, it's a really great study aid. Chris, can you be able to share the slides? Yep. Yeah. I always forget to do that, so just follow up with me and I'll okay. give you.
Okay, I think that we talked about this already. By the way, these images, almost all, I think all the images that I use in this are all generated by Dolly, the image, the AI image generator, including this one. Like I literally said, create a cartoony image about academic integrity, and it came up with this, which is like kind of this anime thing that's did a really like this did not exist before I put that prompt in the do Dolly. Um, so it's neat. So again, plagiarism, we don't know is copying something out of chat GPT plagiarism. It's kind of hard to say, or we need to update our definitions. Um, so it's complicated. Um, cite your sources. If you use chat GPT, APA has uh, ways of citing chat GPT. Um, so, you know, always cite your sources, including your sources, chat GPT. Uh, I do tell students that detectors don't work, but as a budding professional, you should probably develop some ethics of your own, including being honest in these cases. So don't, don't maybe I'm, I don't know if that's a good strategy for students, but be honest. Um, as I said, there's copyright and fair use precedent right now. So a lot of stuff is being worked out. Be careful of harmful bias or fake information that's being incorporated in, through hallucinations and these responses. If you just copy and paste this stuff, out of ChatGPT into an assignment, and I'm talking to you as a student, you're ultimately responsible for that. So if you say something awful because you copied it out of ChatGPT and didn't actually read it thoroughly yourself, um, you're responsible for that, not ChatGPT. And then I already mentioned sensitive and protected data. So I think with the last couple of minutes, our instruct, think about specific courses that you are either doing design with or teaching in, given those capabilities that we talked about and given some of those kind of foundational learning concepts, what, um, what are you thinking about some modifications to assignments? Like let's assume that your assignment is a writing assignment or some kind of data analysis assignment that you know pretty well that students are gonna use ChatGPT to help them. So you don't wanna just sweep this under the carpet and pretend it doesn't exist. Um, how can you modify I'm just always thinking about the community with the, with the iterative process that makes a lot of sense. And by the way, for those iterative assignments too, one of the problems with that particular model of instruction is that it get, it creates a lot more stuff to be graded too. So you're, you're potentially creating a ton of more work for the instructor to deal with. So how things get assessed is like a whole other question. From an instructor standpoint though, you are going to have them use it. You could also use it to help you generate a rubric to help you with the grading yeah. and have an iterate on the things that you are thinking are important in that assignment. I, I think that's a wonderful idea. And I find writing rubrics extremely tedious. So yeah. having AI do that for me and really customizing it to the assignment is great. Or if you're tweaking your course proposal for the faculty senate, um, you know, if you know what you kind of want to teach, but you're, you're stuck on like, what are the different topics we could do under this gen ed course that we're proposing? Mm -hmm. um, I actually put in a title for a gen ed course and it gave me a full syllabus that was actually not terrible. Yeah. And um, and then we put in a list of topics and asked for a course title and it came up with a great So, I mean, it could go either way for, for, for support for faculty members as they're doing. Kind of the other stuff. Yeah. And in the amount of time it would have taken you to write that, you could get a result that you're not totally satisfied with and just make it iterate a hundred times on that until you get the one that you like and just keep tweaking it in the same amount of time. Um, by the way, just I I had my the whiteboard in my office with a bunch of uh, like diagrams and ideas for data analysis and little key terms for my research and stuff. And I, I the one thing that GPT just added a couple weeks ago, it was called Vision, which you can upload an image, and it can make determinations based upon that image. All this was like my left hand, I got terrible handwriting because I'm left-handed. It just like my scribbles on a board. And I took a picture of my whiteboard and I submitted it and I said, tell me what this is about and anything like interesting I could do from here. And it totally gave me, a, it said, it looks like you're probably a student or researcher studying knowledge building or something related to learning sciences. Um, these are the methods that you're using. I would suggest that you use these methods instead. Like it was creepy how well how well it did. So yeah. So different subject. So I wonder about the demographics of 
who is using that? Because it really looks like rich getting richer. Because yep. if I am at a certain level where I'm going to start using it, I'm going to skyrocket mm -hmm. academically, professionally, mm -hmm. mentally. So the person who's not going to use the chat GPT is going to be remain stagnant. Yep. So it, it, and that goes to the equity above all yeah. this. I mean, we can't control it, but it just. Yeah. And I started by saying I feel it's a tectonic shift, but it's going to be a tectonic shift for a way. certain yeah. group of people and not others. Yeah. Others will, I mean, we send people to the and they argue that everyone benefits from it. So, okay, in the long run, everyone's going to benefit from this, but there are people and some of our students are going to be less able to take advantage of what's here unless we actually put it in our classes yeah. and teach them to use it. Yeah, for sure. And there's always been those inequities in society and technology exacerbated this, just people who who get access to technology earlier in their lives and develop those skill sets are more capable of operating in a knowledge society than students that didn't. This is just an order of magnitude worse than that. And I think it's going to be very soon we're going to get to the point, you know, within the next decade where if you don't know, there's going to be people who know how to use AI effectively. And if you're a part of that population of people who didn't get access to it and don't have those skill sets, it will be impossible for you to get any of those sort of knowledge related jobs that 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 inequity will be that huge so uh go, talk to the the Dutton folks <laughs> to get further consultations i really think that the most useful way to apply this is in practice to just try it so so go Dutton and, and work with work with instructional designer um you're welcome to reach out to me as well if you want to bounce some ideas around and i'm kind of collecting ideas of modified assignments as you start to embrace this stuff. So if you have examples that you want to share, I'd love to incorporate that into my own knowledge base. So thank you so much for your time. Yes, thank you, Chris, for, for leading this really interesting and engaging session today. We really appreciate it. And for those of you who are following along online, there are some links in the chat window if you haven't noticed them already. Um, help us make sure that these sessions are customized to your needs. There's a link right there for you to go ahead and fill out a survey. Um, it's a very short survey, I promise, but it's just to help us get better insights into how we can serve you better. Um, also consider joining our Teams channel to stay up to date with the conversations that are happening here on the Dutton Learn uh, series. Lincoln is also in the uh, chat window there. And our next um, Dutton Learn session will be focused on supporting neurodivergent learners and we'll be releasing the date, time, and location uh, information for that session coming soon. Thank you so much for joining us, everyone, and have a great rest of your day.